much appreciated. You could be outside having a, well, actually, the weather's not so good either, is it? But um, yeah, um, thank you for joining us. My name's Chris, Chris Tracy. And as Rachel says, um, I am the archive specialist for Norfolk Record Office. Um, and I work um, normally in Norfolk Heritage Centre um, closely um, with Rachel. Um, we are now open in, in the Norfolk Heritage Centre on the second floor of the Norfolk and Norwich Millennium Library. Um, we're only open for booking, um, so you have to book a slot if you want to come in and, and use the facilities. However, we are open after a long period of closure, so that's, um, that's really good. Um, very, very briefly, um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I'm just going to give a very, very brief overview of, of the Heritage Centre, because obviously one of the, you know, a, a concomitant effect of this um, event is, I hope, that um, if you find yourselves in Norwich at any point, um, you will be encouraged to drop by and, and see what we have to offer, including, of course, some of the, the really, really magnificent um, books that I'm going to be showing you um, this evening. Um, but basically, Norfolk Heritage Centre complements Norfolk Record Office um, in as much as Norfolk Heritage Centre holds published material. Um, Norfolk Record Office, um, on the other hand, based down at County Hall at Martineau Lane, um, holds archive material, um, approximately 12 million items of, of original archive material relating to the history of Norfolk, um, generated by individuals and, and institutions um, and local government and what have you, over approximately sort of eight, 800 years, going right back to the medieval period. But as I say, Norfolk Heritage Centre complements the collection there in as much as we hold printed published material. So books, obviously, thousands and thousands of local studies, books, directories, maps, plans, photographs, newspapers, prints, um, ephemera, so things like bus tickets and menus and posters and advertising, local businesses, that sort of thing. Um, and also um, many, many uh, cabinets stuffed to the gills with uh, microfilms and microfiche um, which have uh, duplicates of uh, many of the more frequently used um, items uh, for, for hist historical research and family history um, that are held at the record office in the original, but we hold duplicates. So things like parish registers, wills, poor law records, um, city records, um, that kind of thing as well. Um, but most importantly, as it says at the bottom, um, we have experienced staff. So um, if there's anything um, that you think we might have that you might that you think might find you might find useful for your research, or if you're just vaguely interested and want to pop in and, and, and have a look at any time, um, you know, please, please do so. Right, okay, there we are, that's the Heritage Centre in pre-COVID, imagine that, pre-COVID times. That's the store, that's our stack. And I wanted to just um, put a little uh, photograph of the stack in because that is where the treasures that I'm gonna be showing you momentarily live um, normally. Um, the COVID uh, situation we found ourselves in for the past year and more um, has obviously been very difficult for everyone. Um, Heritage Centre, as I said, has been closed until very recently. Um, but one very small, one very small silver lining um, to the whole COVID uh, thing, purely for me personally, um, was that the normal stuff that I do, um, so school visits, um, to the Heritage Centre, helping people um, with their um, inquiries and, and doing family history courses and this sort of thing. Um, all of that sort of, well, literally overnight stopped. And it gave me a bit of, bit of time, um, as well as developing um, events such as this that we, you know, we've been able to do online and, and via other, other technologies. Um, it enabled me to just sort of step back a little bit and have a bit of a, a real think about and explore some of the things that we actually hold because day to day you know it's I'm sure Rachel will agree me, agree with me it's it can be quite busy in a in a busy library um, you're dealing with customers you know all that sort of thing um, so it was really quite a good opportunity just to step back and really have a look at some of the collections and really this session today is born out of that because although I was aware um, that we had a number of um, private press books particularly Kelmscott press books which I focused on in a in a talk um, which which was first we first did um, about three or four weeks ago and, and then, that, then I'm repeating again um, on July the 8th actually focusing on the Kelmscott press books and William Morris specifically um, I hadn't really as I say had the time to really sort of look at them and and, and appreciate them um, you know the, the, the full um, full importance and full magnificence of them and so 
as I say, today then is 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 born of that. Um, and I've had a tremendous amount of, of, of fun um, learning more about these books and um, reading up about them. You know, I, would, I wouldn't describe myself as, a, as, as an expert by any means. I, I suppose an enthusiast um, would be the best term. But, you know, I'm very, very enthusiastic about these books. And, you know, I'm really pleased that you're able to join me this evening to, um, you know, share, share and the appreciation that I have for them. OK, so. As I say, um, I'm going to give a little bit of a recap and a sort of a, a contextual um, little sort of um, preamble to a certain extent before we look at some of the particular private press books that um, published were published in the wake um, of the Kelmscott Press. Um, the photograph you see before you, and I apologise if, if, to a certain extent, if any of you have already um, attended the talk uh, which I gave a few weeks ago, purely focusing on, on William Morris and the Kelmscott Press books that we have. Um, you will have seen this and, and one or two following slides already. Um, but this, this photograph here shows our Kelmscott Press books uh, with Mr. Francis High um, in his library. He, he was the original owner of the books and he's pictured here in 1925. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's believed that the, the books were originally donated um, to Norwich uh, Public Library. Um, well, actually, it was, first of all, donated to Norwich Castle Museum in the 1940s, the collection, and then found their way to the Norwich Central Library in 1962. So these these are all those books pictured here. And this is one of them in detail. Um, and this is sort of really the first slide proper that I want to start off with today, because this, this is, um, as it says here, you can, you can read it <laughs> at the top. This is a note by William Morris on his aims in founding the Kelmscott Press. So this book was the last book published um, by the Kelmscott Press um, in 1898. Um, Morris um, had died a couple of years earlier in 1896, and I'm sure many of you will be aware of William Morris and his extraordinary achievements. Um, absolute astonishing character and, and, and in terms of the breadth um, and you know the, the distinction and, and true quality of, of all the different artistic endeavors um, he turned his hand to you know absolutely um, unsurpassed I mean you know I'm sure many of you are aware he, he founded uh, Morris Marshall Faulkner and Co um, fine art workmen in painting carving furniture and the metals which later um, went on, of course, to become simply Morris and Co, and then continued into the into the 20th century. Um, he was a designer of, of wonderful furnishings, encompassing furniture, fabric, wallpapers, um, stained glass. Wonderful, wonderful writer. Um, you know, a poet of the of the first rank. Um, it was he, he was you know sort of uh, put forward as a potential successor to uh, um, Alfred Lord Tennyson as as, as poet laureate when uh, when Tennyson died. So it really was you know. He didn't just do all this stuff. He excelled at everything pretty much that he touched. Um, and also, of course, he was a, an extraordinary political campaigner, which is relevant because, um, you know, his, 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 his social, social, socialism, his uh, fervently held, um, sincerely held um, left wing beliefs, you know, really key um, part of his character and, and relevant to his um, artistic achievement in terms of um, you know, what his aims were in terms of founding the Kelmscott Press, wanting um, to, to, to make these beautiful things accessible, you know, relatively reason, reasonably priced and, and what have you. Um, but this particular book, I just wanted to show you, as well as a few more um, momentarily, just to give you a bit of a flavour of the Kelmscott Press, really, and to, to sort of, you know, plant that um, standard there, if, if, if you will, because the, 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 the private presses that flourished in the late 19th and early, early to mid 20th century in England really were, you know, to a greater or lesser extent, hugely influenced by Kelmscott, even if that influence is a sort of a negative influence, as we'll see in the case of the Doves Press, for example, who kind of reacted um, against what was um, seen by the, uh, by the owner of, of Doves Press as kind of a overly um, ostentatious um, uh, style uh, of Kelmscott. Um, but yeah, so what we're going to do now, before I show you one or two more examples of Kelmscott, just to sort of, you know, set that in your mind to sort of give you a bit of context as we move forward and examine some some more individual examples um, of the books. I tell you what, what we ought to do, actually, I've moved forward. Um, I'm just going to 
bear with me just a moment. We'll, we'll stay there um, because I think it's worth, you know, it's absolutely necessary at this point to just consider for a moment this term, private fine press. Um, I think, I think the, the title of this talk was the, the road from Kelmscott, um, fine and private press books in the, in the Heritage Centre collection. So it's worth just spending a moment to consider, you know, what do we mean um, by a private press as opposed to perhaps a fine press? Well, um, I'm sure, and again, apologies for those of you who, for whom this is, this is sucking eggs, but the private press, the term private press can lend itself um, to many different interpretations. Um, some fairly narrow, some fairly purist, and, and others rather, rather broader. The complication, I suppose, is that there are a number of different types of um, presses, um, book publishers, book, book printers, um, which may be technically deemed private, but which generally would not be um, thought to, to fall within the, the scope of what we're, what we're considering today. So, for example, clandestine presses, um, such as those that uh, printed propaganda during the, um, during the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation years, Second World War, of course, as well. Um, scholarly presses, um, presses set up um, for, for missionary purposes to, to spread, um, spread the word. Um, presses used sort of primarily um, in the words of, of Roderick Cave, who wrote the private press um, as aristocratic playthings for, for well-to-do um, aristocrats and uh, other sort of uh, what, what might be characterized as sort of pastime presses or hobby presses, um, which uh, sort of particularly emerged um, in the mid to late Victorian era with the sort of emergence of, of the middle classes and, and uh, you know, greater um, uh, sort of uh, wealth that could be could be used for, for, for enjoyment of sort of genteel pursuits, such as um, getting your own um, uh, printing press. So, so all of these things could be um, legitimately termed private presses, but they're not really what we um, is generally understood by the term when we're thinking about the production of fine books and the book arts and all of those different um, uh, skills and occupations and professions that go into the, to, to the making of a fine book, such as obviously typographers and printers and bookbinders, um, calligraphers, um, and such. Um, so a good summary um, is provided in in uh, in uh, the uh, in the private press, the book uh, written by Roderick K. The second edition I'm quoting from, uh, which I believe was um, published in 1982, and he quotes in that book um, John Carter, who wrote the following um, uh, summary in his uh, catalogue of the exhibition of the English private presses 1757 to 1961, which was an exhibition held at the Times Bookshop in 1961. So he wrote, John Carter, the fundamental principle of private press printing, the principle that whether or not the press has to pay its way, the printer is more interested in making a good book than a fat profit. He prints what he likes, how he likes, not what someone else has paid him to print. If now and then he produces something more apt for looking at and handling than for the mundane purpose of reading, remember that he is concerned as much with his own pleasure and education as with yours. So um, if one uh, sets aside the slightly um, um, antiquated uh, patrician slash uh, sexist sort of verging on tone, it's all what he likes, how he likes, isn't it? Um, but yeah, that, that fairly neatly covers it. It's basically people doing it in-house, getting, getting their own press and printing books for the sake of printing books, a beautiful book um, without um, you know, worrying about commercial considerations. Fundamentally, you know, although there are, um, there are lines um, which are blurred between, between what might be termed a, private, a purely private press and a fine press, which may have similar um, artistic aims, but perhaps, um, for example, use um, the the printing plant of a commercial um, commercial outfit or whatever. So, private press, fine press terms can be, um, you know, individual um, printers um, and and presses can be sort of to a greater or lesser extent be under both of those terms. But the the main thing to consider is that these are books which have been printed 
by 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 presses whose sole aim is you know they may want to turn a profit as well obviously to keep going but the main key aim is the production of of beautiful books which would not otherwise um, come into existence okay so um i'm just going to before we um look at a uh, sort of just skim a few more examples of the Kelmscott press books again just to sort of um get that uh, sort of solidly um, in your mind. I'm just going to, and again, apologies to those of you who may have attended the, the previous talk. Um, this is a sort of a condensed um, sort of uh, preamble sort of uh, made out of uh, slides, which, uh, which, I, which I used in that talk. Um, but I just wanted to show you one or two um, slides of a couple of, of incunabula. So that's early printed books in our collection, Renaissance era books, um, the term incunabula referring generally to books um, printed before 1500, 1501, excuse me, um, because um, William Morris was, of course, hugely, hugely influenced, um, not only um, by his, his own um, artistic, uh, artistic inclinations and his interests as a book collector um, and a calligrapher, of course, um, but um, hugely by the um, influence of the, of the early printers. Um, as I said, I think, um, uh, in the in the last talk, you know, William Morris basically did um, feel that um, book um, printing um, reached its absolute zenith, you know, roughly sort of 1480 to, to 1500 ish and, and um, pretty much declined um, from there. So I thought it would be useful, again, as, as with the Kelmscott um, books, just to show you some examples of um, Incunabula from our collections. And here we have, of course, the the exterior of the wonderful um, Nuremberg Chronicle or Liber Chronicarum, um, printed by Anton Koberger um, in 17, uh, sorry, not 17, <laughs> 14, uh, 1473, sorry, 1493, I'll get it right in a moment, um, 1493, um, printed by Anton Koberger, um, written um, by Hartmann Schadel. It's a superb, huge volume, which, as you can see, um, manifests in its appearance um, all of the um, all of the sort of uh, print principles in terms of book pr uh, book production which Kelmscott and William Morris um, were to really take to heart and follow um, and uh, indeed uh, Morris outlined in his notes to the founding of the, of, of the Kelmscott press um, so in that respect I, I mean specifically um, the the way in which um, Morris felt that uh, the uh, the unit, the, the, the ideal and the, and the actual unit of a book would, was not the page, but the double page spread. So with that in mind, um, Morris took from the early printers um, quite strict, really, um, ideas in terms of the proportions of the layout. So this um, maintained that uh, the uh, proportions with regard to margins should adhere um, to, to a particular sort of formula whereby, um, as with this, as with the, the, the uh, Nuremberg Chronicle here, the inner margin um, would be the smallest, um, then going sort of um, clockwise, um, the, the, the upper on the, for the right hand leaf or the right hand um, page, um, the, the, the margin at the top of the page would then be slightly wider. The, the, the margin on the right hand side or, or indeed the left hand side um, would be wider still and then the widest margin would be that at the bottom of the page and this was as I say as was uh, Morris felt you know the the, 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 the most um, sort of beautiful and um, helpful layout um, to promote um, ease easeful reading of the of the text um, the, the the Nuremberg Chronicle here, in a printed in a, in a in a gothic or black letter um, type, as you can see, as were many of the the Kelmscott um, books, um, and copiously illustrated with these marvelous um, woodcuts. Um, Nuremberg Chronicle, you know, is 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 you know one of the most famous um, early printed books, um, and it's particularly renowned for the for the um, numerousness and the you know the sheer um, you know, the, the, the ebullience of the, of the woodcut illustrations, which are, you know, really striking and, and magnificent things. Um, so if we go just to 
go through the a few more pages of the wonderful Nuremberg Chronicle we've got there. You can see um, a, a depiction of Noah and his uh, building his ark there on the on the right hand side. I should say um, the Chronicle, in terms of the content, um, the Chronicle is basically a kind of a um, a history of the Christian world, a universal history of the Christian world um, from the beginning, the beginning of times, um, right through to the, the period in which the book was printed, the 1490s. Um, there are about 1240 copies um, believed to survive um, of the Latin edition, of which this is one. Um, and we can see here the colophon, uh, which gives the, the date of printing and details um, about the printing. So we can see that it was printed um, in July um, 1493. And the tradition um, of having a colophon at the end um, of the early printed book, um, giving details of, 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 of the book's production and the print, the name of the printer and perhaps who the patron of the book was, um, when it was printed, when it was finished, all this sort of thing. That, of course, is something else which Kelmscott um, took on um, and for the most part, the private presses, which followed in Kelbscott's wake, um, also um, continued, and we shall see examples of that as we go through. Another thing, um, as with the colophon, um, the printer's mark um, as well. Um, again, to a lesser well, to a, to a, to a certain extent, uh, many of the um, the private presses actually, yeah, most of the private presses did did um, did uh, follow in in. Uh, uh, the, the early printer's wake and, and Kelmscott's wake in, in having their own printer's mark. And we'll see examples of this um, later on. Uh, this particular printer's mark is not from the, um, not from the Nuremberg Chronicle, um, but rather um, from, and I apologize for all of my um, dodgy pronunciation throughout um, this, um, but uh, the Practica uh, of Antonius Guanerius, uh, which was edited um, by Hieronymus Faventius, sorry, Faventinus, um, and printed in Venice in 1497. So again, this is one of our books. Um, we're so lucky, <laughs> Rachel and I, um, to have, act, you know, to, to, to be able to, to, to have immediate access to these marvellous things. Um, this book, just like the Nuremberg Chronicle, um, is kept in our stack and comes from the Norwich City Library. I'm just going to digress for a moment because I think, um, you know, it, it's worth pointing out um, Norwich City Library is a sort of a discreet, the Norwich City Library collection is kind of a discreet collection um, within um, the Norfolk Heritage Centre and the Millennium Library um, collections. Obviously, the Millennium Library is the modern day Norwich City Library, of which the Heritage Centre is a part on the second floor. Um, but the City Library collection refers specifically to the collection of books um, which were accumulated um, originally by the Norwich City Library, which was first um, founded in 1608. Um, so, um, as, as many of you will know, Norwich um, at that time, right up until the uh, sort of uh, start of the Industrial Revolution, really, in the sort of mid, mid to late 18th century, Norwich was the second city after London. So, you know, not the, not the backwater that uh, many, many uh, sort of rather uh, rudely uh, view us as. Um, but uh, yeah, so the Norwich City Library was founded in 1608 um, and was one of the first of its kind to be founded outside of London. Um, so it, it, was, uh, it was founded primarily for visiting preachers uh, and those coming to, to preach in the, um, in the cathedral and in the, the various different churches um, in Norwich. Um, uh, and so primarily it's made up of religious books, but there are also other things as well. So um, books relating to law, uh, geography, uh, there are a few medical related books as well. But basically we've got about 2000 um, volumes. I think that's right, 2000. Um, and it's a discrete collection and they are a superb collection of, of early printed books, many of which um, date from, you know, very, very early on. So pre 1500, 1501. Um, but many others going into the into the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. Um, I'm very, very briefly just going to give a plug as well, um, because over the past few years, Rachel and I have been very fortunate in working um, in collaboration with a couple of academics from the University of East Anglia, um, Tom Roebuck and uh, Sophie Butler, um, 
and uh, they've been doing a project called Unlocking the Archive. So if you Google that, Unlocking the Archive, they've produced in the last year or two a wonderful, wonderful website called Discover Historic Books, uh, which features a number um, of our of our city library and, and other early printed books, as well as early printed books at the Blickling Hall uh, National Trust uh, Library, which, which is superb, um, and also um, some wonderful books up at Northumberland uh, Libraries as well, as well as other books held in within Norfolk Library Service, um, held at the Kings Lynn uh, St Margaret's Library as well. Um, so this particular, just to, sorry, just to come back to the main thread again, this particular print is Mark um, as I say, is taken from the um, Practica, uh, which is printed in Venice in 1497. Um, and the printer was Ottaviano Scotto. So this is his particular printer's mark. Printer's marks, as you've probably worked out, um, are fundamentally trademarks. Um, they weren't uh, generally used right in the early days of printing, sort of 1450s, 60s. Um, but as the uh, 15th century sort of wound its way to its end and then crept into the early 1500s, printer's marks by the early printers started to become a feature and effective, effectively were kind of trademarks um, really. Um, so we can see as with this one, the, the printer's name Ottaviano Scotto, um, he was born in 1444, died in 1499, so not, um, not long after this particular book uh, was printed um, and you can see his his mark here um, comprises his his initials the O and the S uh, with also a sort of a orb and cross um, kind of uh, motif with the orb um, divided into the sort of upper and lower um, sort of spheres but um, yeah a pleasing and actually quite sort of also sort of got a, quite a sort of a modern uh, modern feel about it hasn't it These, the, the printer's marks in themselves you know even separate from the books um, a marvelous marvelous things just to consider and a really can be really striking um, you know interesting and visually um, inventive and you know really in terms of a graphic design perspective you know really intriguing um, phenomena early early printed um, books printers marks right okay so I'm going to whiz through a number of Kelmscott books um, I, I make no apology for this because as I say I do think it helps you give you that context um, but again apologies to those who attended the last session because you will you will be familiar with these but I'm just going to whip through these um, so we have the golden legend here um, which was the book which William Morris um, first intended his his press to print in the end in the in the end um, he ended up printing um, a handful well more than a handful a large handful of smaller books um, at Kelmscott um, in the initial year uh, sort of uh, sort of months of the press because the the paper that he ordered um, was was not suitable um, w w wasn't large enough effectively um, so the gold the golden legend um, had to be sort of held off but it, it did eventually emerge um, uh, with the uh, the eponymous golden type which uh, which Morris designed um, with it in mind um, here we have the magnificent title page um, and the uh, one of the two illustrations, uh, woodcut illustrations designed um, by uh, Sir Edward, um, Sir Edward Byrne Jones. Um, woodcut illustrations, of course, another um, key feature of many of the private press books, which which followed um, Kelmscott, particularly the Golden Cockrell Press, which will um, and Gregory Nog Press as well, which we'll um, talk about as we as we go through. But um, that is a magnificent um, double page spread. Um, as you can see, uh, Morris, um, as he expounded in his uh, notes on the founding of the Kelmscott Press, um, here Morris manifesting that um, ideal um, in terms of page design, which I mentioned earlier with regard to the early printed books, those um, very, uh, very well proportioned uh, margins with the, the inner margin being smaller than the, the upper margin and then the side margin being larger still and then the widest um, at the bottom. And uh, you can see here also these wonderful um, initial letters, which are clearly um, influenced by some of the some of the marvelous um, initial uh, woodcut um, uh, lettering that you can see on on um, many early printed books, including those which we're fortunate enough to have in the uh, the Heritage Centre collections. One more, Cam Scott. Um, this is primarily just to show you the 
the, the to contrast the um, the bindings because this one, like many of the um, Kelmscott press books and many private press books, um, excuse me, following is bound in vellum with the silk ties um, that you can see there visible. Um, the prior, the, the previous book, the Golden uh, Golden Legend, one of the few Kelmscott press books not um, to be bound. Um, in vellum, it was sort of in a, it was in a sort of a canvas or sort, of, sort of fabric, um, half Holland, uh, I believe it's called um, binding. But uh, the Godfrey of Boulogne, one of the many William Caxton texts which Morris printed um, and felt by many to be, you know, one of his most successful in terms of the overall um, design of the book. Um, Morris designed um, some particularly marvelous um, decorations and uh, border uh, decorations and what have you. Uh, for this this particular text, but as you can see, another splendid, um, if somewhat um, dizzying to look at, um, opening title page spread there. Um, but then again, you know, although uh, printed in a um, in a black letter Gothic style, rather than the golden type which we've already seen in the Golden Legend, this one is printed um, in the Troy um, type, which um, which Morris um, designed himself and uh, was, uh, as the name suggests, was intended um, for his uh, his edition um, of Caxton's uh, the Recuvils of the, the Histories of Troy. Um, Morris, of course, had to go on to, to produce a smaller, um, a smaller version of the of the Troy black letter type because uh, um, he wanted to use it for Chaucer, and the Chaucer volume was so huge. Um, that uh, the Troy type would have been far too large for it, so he, uh, uh, he designed the smaller version, the Chaucer type. But um, as you can see um, here with the, the Godfrey um, of Boulogne, um, these marvellous decorative borders um, and the Kelmscott Press mark there, printer's mark just below the colophon. So as you can see, I referred earlier with regard to the Nuremberg Chronicle uh, that the colophon and the printer's mark was something that Kelmscott took on. And as we shall see, um, that was that was continued in many of the uh, the, the majority, uh, I, would, I would say, of the, of, the, of the private presses which followed. Um, this is the, um, the second Kelmscott uh, press printer's mark. I haven't got a picture of the earlier one, which was used in the in the initial books. Um, I, I included this one purely to fit with the, um, the Godfrey of Boulogne um, text, but um, personally I find the earlier one um, a little more attractive, but um, they're both, both absolutely ma magnificent, um, really decorative and interesting visually um, printer's marks. Right, okay, so I'm aware that we've got to just over half an hour in, um, and I haven't actually um, discussed any private press books apart from um, Morris and the Kelmscott and uh, obviously discussing some of the um, in cannabular in our collections but I hope that that is okay by you because we're we're well into the well into our um, into our stride now um, but as I say I think it's useful to have that um, have that contextual information um, what we have here then is the one Dove's Press book that I'm aware of in our collections um, I should say we haven't got a huge, vast number of private press books uh, that, 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 that I've been able to find in our collections. However, we are, thankfully, for the purposes of this talk, um, able to, to, to call up on our catalogue um, one or two examples of most of the main, if not all, um, of the main um, sort of private presses which followed in Kelmscott's um, wake. And the first of those really, I'll be going kind of chronologically um, through. Um, there are one or two sort of, um, you know, sort of going backwards and forwards to a certain extent, but in the main, I'm kind of following examples of books from the different presses and I'm going in, in chronological order with regard to the founding of the press really. Um, but yeah, so what we have here then is the one example of a Dove's Press book in our collections and it's the, um, I'll try and pronounce this, Aria Pagetica, <laughs> I haven't done that very well, Aria Pagetica, yeah, um, Milton, John Milton's Aria Pagetica, that's better, um, and this is like the, the previous Kelmscott Press book that you saw, bound in vellum, although as you can see it's a much, much smaller 
smaller book. It's got the uh, the title on the spine there, and then you've got the sort of opening page here. And I'm sure you can take in immediately the contrast with 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 Kelmscott. Um, to give you the sort of um, background information before we sort of discuss this, in 1900 um, and came out of uh, the vision of T.J. Cobden Sanderson, who was the, the prime uh, moving force behind the press. He set it up um, with um, Emery Walker and they operated as a partnership. Um, uh, Cobden Sanderson um, had been a bookbinder he was a, an extraordinary figure, really interesting um, and rather sort of slightly batty man, really. Um, he, uh, he came from a sort of, a, I believe, an upper sort of upper middle class, well-to-do um, background, trained as a lawyer. But he was sort of a, uh, reading up on him. I gather he was of, of something of a, of a nervous disposition and, and had a number of sort of breakdowns and sort of crises. Um, the upshot of these and the sort of um, eight, late 1880s, 1890s was that he decided to become a bookbinder, which, you know, obviously, certainly as far as I'm concerned, is a perfectly um, honourable um, profession, um, praiseworthy profession. But um, clearly at that time for a, for a man of his class and social circle was sort of deemed to be rather bizarre. Um, but he, he, he knew William Morris. Um, he he uh, was a friend of Morris um, and had been encouraged by Morris and Morris's wife Jane to become a bookbinder. He set up the Doves Bindery first of all um, in the mid 1890s, um, and the Doves Bindery became known for, for producing absolutely superb um, bindings for, for books, um, among which were a number of, of Kelmscott Press books. Um, and the Doves Bindery um, went on, of course, to um, to, to produce um, the, the 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 main. Um, luxury binding of the of the Kelmscott Chaucer, the magnificent um, white pigskin um, and superbly um, stamped um, uh, Kelmscott Chaucer. Um, so yeah, Cobden Sanderson, um, it was his was the vision, um, and as I say, he ran it in conjunction uh, with Emery Walker. Emery Walker, of course, um, had been absolutely pivotal um, in the founding and the operation of the Kelmscott Press. Um, Morris had. Um, it's, it's generally thought, um, sort of uh, uh, formally invited Emery Walker um, to be a partner in the Kelmscott Press, but um, being, uh, being a man of, of a modest, uh, modest uh, disposition and uh, uh, he, he, he declined and uh, despite that, however, sort of became effectively a partner in all but name and certainly it was his um, know-how and expertise with regard to the early printers and their types and, and uh, uh, his, his knowledge with his background as a printer, which enabled uh, Morris to, to, to successfully found the press and to design his own types. Um, famously, um, it was Emery Walker's lecture um, on November the 15th, 1888, the Arts and Crafts Society lecture, um, which he gave um, outlining um, his, his enthusiasms for the early printers and the, the early types of early printers such as Nicholas Jensen, um, which was famously, this lecture was, was illustrated um, by um, then um, you know, sort of seldom seen uh, sort of magic lantern slides, which um, blew up these, these marvelous examples of, of early printed um, type and typography into a, to a larger format. Um, it was this which um, you know, really fired uh, Morris um, and, 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 and spurred him on to found the Kelmscott Press. Um, but yeah, so the Doves Press, joint operation between Cobden Sanderson and, uh, and Emery Walker. Um, but as, as you can see, uh, to get back to the main point that I was seeing, that, 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 that I sort of started to, 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 to uh, outline earlier on, um, the, the sh as soon as you, you, are, you open a Doves Press book, you can see the, the difference and the, the philosophy and the vision is almost diametrically opposed to Kelmscott. Um, uh, I can't remember who it was. Um, one of the one of these sort of movers and shakers in the in the in the private press book, uh, private press movement. Um, I can't, it might have been Cobden Sanderson. I don't think it was, but um, someone said that um, Kelmscott press books had pages full of wine, 
whereas Dove's press books had pages full of light, which is a which is a beautiful way of putting it. And I think, you know, it hits the nail on the head, doesn't it? Kelmscott Press, despite um, Morris's protestations in in his notes on the founding of the of the press to uh, you know wanting to make a book which was beautiful and and yet did not dazzle the eye and was easy to read. Mm, not sure that's <laughs> however magnificent the Kelmscott Press books are, and they are, and I love them. Um, I, I I don't think you can always say that they don't um, dazzle the eye. They they, they do sometimes. Um, but the Dove's Press books, as you can see, um, ease of reading. Um, being a pure vehicle for the text to convey the text in the simplest and most effective way possible was the was was the, was, was the prime um, motivation for Copland Sanderson um, in his founding of the Doves Press. Uh, this particular book um, is uh, John Milton um, Ariopagitica, um, and uh, it was printed in 1907. It's generally thought, thought to be, you know, the, the most superb um, example of the book. The the book was uh, um, originally printed in uh, 1644, um, and it was a polemic. Um, it was Milton's um, sort of uh, polemical response um, to the uh, uh, attempts of the of the government at the time in England to to censor the press and and to to have licensing for for, for authors and, and publishers and what have you. So it's a, essentially a, an argument for the freedom freedom of the press. Um, so it's an apt it's an apt book, uh, an apt text for the, for, for this book. Um, you can see um, the only decoration on Dove's press books are the initials, um, designed um, and sometimes hand. Um, um, hand drawn or, or elements of them hand um, drawn by designers such as or calligraphers I should say such as um, the the uh, pivotal figure he was Edward um, Johnston um, calligrapher in the late um, 19th and early 20th century and also Grady Hewitt um, two figures who 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 were you know, huge in terms of their influence on the on the book arts and the private press movement at this time um, so there we go. That's just, you know, that's obviously the, the end of the, of the book there uh, with the, the, the colophon on the right hand side printed at the Dove's Press by T.J. Cobden Sanson and Emery Walker from the first edition, etc, etc, um, published and sold at the Dove's Press. Um, so again, carrying on that tradition of the colophon um, as, um, as seen in the, the Nuremberg Chronicle. Um, I'm sorry, I, sh I should perhaps have, have, have had one or two more um, examples of the pages, but to be perfectly honest, you get the idea. It's clear, it's simple, it's elegant, um, and you know, it's it's um, as I say, the polar opposite of the Kelmscott sort of um, philosophy. Um, the, the other important thing to say about Dove's Press, of course, is the type. The Dove's type um, was seen as particularly um, admirable. You know, really, really elegant, simple. Um, as as with Morris, um, well, I've already I've already described um, Emery Walker's um, pivotal position in terms of the the Kelmscott Press, but with with Emery Walker's um, expertise, Doves were able um, to to create a type which was very very closely modelled on, although not a slavish copy of, but very very closely modelled on um, one of the early um, types of the early printers. Um, this, of course, became um, so the Dove's type, you know, is, is became the, almost has become a legendary kind of typeface for, for, for those who are interested in typography. Um, unfortunately, it became the, uh, the bone of contention, uh, which 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 resulted um, in, in a sort of a legendary um, incident. Um, with regard to to uh, the private presses, um, Emery Walker and uh, Cobden Sanderson um, were very different personalities, and their their relationship was, although successful for a number of years, um, one might put put it at strained. Um, as I say, Cobden Sanderson, um, very visionary. Um, he described himself um, quite gleefully as a as a as a uh, fanatic. I am a fanatic. He he wrote um, and. Uh, Emery Walker, one gets the impression that Emery Walker was a much more sort of um, unassuming, um, fairly sort of, uh, uh, you know, phlegmatic, um, straightforward sort of character. 
Um, but basically they argued that, that, that they had two, the, the relationship became strained over time um, and uh, they, they, they became embroiled in legal dispute with each other, arguing over who would get control of the Dove's type. Um, and basically um, Emery Walk was rather hard done by because he agreed um, to, a, to a legal sort of um, arrangement whereby um, he would sort of leave the, the Dove's press um, and Cobden Sanderson would have use of the Dove's typeface um, for the for the for the remainder of, of his of his life and his printing. But then the Dove, the Dove's type would be given um, to to Emery Walker, who had of course played such a, a large part in its design and its manufacture. Um, unfortunately, um, as I say, um, Cobden Sanderson was 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 a visionary, a fanatic, um, and he 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 was. He was never going to going to allow his type to to fall into the hands of another person to be used for books other than his own visionary productions um, and so on. And over a number of um, uh, over a number of nights, I can't remember the year in which it was, but he legendarily threw the typeface into the Thames. So he stole out in the middle of the night and in in little um, sort of uh, you know handfuls or whatever threw the the the, the type into the Thames. Um, very romantic, if, if not very annoying, if you were Emery Walker. Um, but actually, um, a few years ago, um, someone actually um, hired a, a, a graphic, I believe it was a, a graphic designer or someone interested in graphic design. If you Google this, you can find the story um, easily enough. But basically, um, someone hired some, some uh, divers and they recovered a vast, um, I think the majority of, of the Dove's typeface from the riverbed of the Thames. Um, and um, I think the prime mover behind this um, then has, has, has licensed or has, has, has got um, on, on, uh, on uh, you know, you can via online, you can basically subscribe and, and sort of buy access to use the Dove's type if you, if you wish to in your Word um, documents or what have you, but um, which sort of is, is, is great in one respect, but also sort of one wonders what, um, <laughs> <laughs> what Copton Sanderson would have would have thought about such a thing. But anyway, there we are. So um, I digress. So this one here, we're moving on then. So this this is um, similar in appearance. Uh, this book here is an example of a book from the Ashendine Press. Ashendine, one of the sort of triumvirate, if you like, of the three sort of real, real sort of key presses with, with Dove's, Dove's Press and Kelmscott Press. Um, Outwardly, outwardly very similar to the Kelmscott press books. And in fact, um, whilst I was sort of ferreting around in the, in the stack um, over the last year or so, um, I had no idea that we had this. Um, and I just um, sort of picked it up. It was, it was shelved on the end of the Kelmscott press books. And I picked it up and I assumed it was another Kelmscott press book. Um, but on closer inspection, um, as you can see the, the spine title there, Fioretti di C. Francesco. Um, the book, the text, although it's obviously printed um, with, with the silk tires and bound in vellum, just like many of the Kelmscott Press books, printed by the Ashendine Press in 1922, uh, one of 240 copies um, printed on paper. There were 12 on vellum. And as I say, in this, this limp vellum binding with the green silk ties, um, the text is in Italian. And it's uh, the little flowers of Francis of Assisi. So basically, this is um, what was the name the, the technical name apparently um, is a florile florilegium. So that means the excerpts of his body of work of, of St. Francis. So it's basically a classic sort of collection of, um, of kind of popular legends about the life of St. Francis, um, effectively. And it's attributed um, to, a, to a medieval uh, monk in the uh, the late um, sort of uh, or, or rather early 14th um, century um, but the book itself um, is rather interesting from a local perspective again I'm going to go on s off on a slight tangent because um, aside from the sort of um, history of these books um, in terms of their printing and the, the their appearance and their printing by the presses and the content and all that sort of thing of course many of the individual volumes have really interesting um, provenance in terms of their um, particular um, owners and, and, and the stories attached to them. And this particular book is, is an example of that, because when we opened it, Rachel and I um, were very intrigued to find this subscription. Um, so as you can see, it reads written in, not, not, not obviously by, by a librarian, I hasten to add, to Bianca Locker Lampson on her marriage, wishing 
many blessings uh, and appears to be J, um, L, uh, G, and then we've got the date there, um, 23, 6, 6, the, the 9th, 23. So obviously this was given as a wedding present, um, which apart from anything else is pretty pretty cool, isn't it? Imagine having that as a wedding present. It sort of beats a toaster, doesn't it? Um, Marvellous. Um, but yeah, so so uh, Rachel sort of, I mean, I must admit this name was unfamiliar to me, uh, but Rachel pointed out that Locker Lampson um, was the name of a, of a famous MP um, in Norfolk, a, a member of parliament in the early 20th century. And we've got a photograph here, uh, which can be found on our um, online um, digitized um, photography website, Picture Norfolk. Um, and as you can see, it's Sir Ernest Shackleton, the famous Antarctic explorer um, on the left-hand side, excuse me, with Commander Oliver Locker Lampson at New Haven. So Oliver Locker Lampson uh, was the husband um, of, uh, of Bianca um, to whom this book was given for their wedding. They, they, they married, as the inscription says, in 1923, um, and unfortunately, the marriage um, didn't last very long um, because very, very sadly, Bianca, who was a Californian, Bianca Jacqueline Paget, um, died um, only a few years later in 1929, um, rather tragically, on, the, on the Christmas Day, apparently. Um, but there we are. Oliver Locker Lampson um, was really sort of uh, was a Tory MP. Um, he inherited the... Uh, uh, um, New Haven Court, um, home at Cromer, um, and was, was quite an interesting character um, by all accounts. Uh, apparently had a distinguished war career, um, was, was, uh, was involved in uh, shenanigans in, uh, in uh, sort of pre-revolutionary Russia, um, and, and also sort of founded the, uh, the, what was the, the beginnings of the, uh, the, uh, the Cromer Carnival and what have you. But um, yeah, he's also very famous for uh, giving um, refuge to uh, Albert Einstein, of course, as well. Albert Einstein uh, spent a bit of time in Norfolk um, after, he, uh, after he fled fled the Nazis. And uh, that's probably Oliver Locker Lampson's prime um, claim to fame for most people. But anyway, moving back to the books. So this is um, the sort of opening uh, of, of a, a double page spread from the Ashendine Press, this marvellous, marvellous um, woodcut um, with the, the opening red initials, um, unlike the Doves Press, they, I mean, this is a very simplistic way of putting it, but from my perspective, I f having, having spent a bit of time with the Kelmscott book books um, and, um, you know, researched a little bit about Doves and, and had a look at the Doves Press book that we're fortunate enough to have, to me, Ashentine, Ashentine Press kind of feels a little bit about, a little bit like the sort of nice mix between the two. Um, so certainly a lot more ornamentation and visual um, decoration than Dove's press books, um, but sort of without um, without that really overt um, sort of uh, gothic um, ornamented style, which which Morris was obviously um, to 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 really um, sort of put into the Kelmscott Brooks. Um, so we've got the uh, the similar sort of initials again, um, the Edward Johnston and, and uh, Grayley Hewitt. Um, uh, were, were influential in designing the, the, uh, the, the, the initials here. And some of the Ashendine Press books, again, um, were hand-drawn. Not all of them, but I believe someone, um, I heard this on a, on a podcast somewhere um, recently, that there is someone, a scholar at this very moment, doing quite a lot of work on Ashendine Press books um, and sort of cataloging all the different variations in terms of, in terms of the hand-drawn um, calligraphic initials. Um, but um, yeah, really, really beautiful, beautiful books incorporating woodcuts. Um, this particular um, one uh, had woodcuts by Charles Gear, who again was a familiar name for those who were interested in Kelmscott Press. He was in one of the, I believe, was one of the um, sort of wood engravers who was used um, to produce some of the Kelmscott Press woodcuts as well. Cut by J.B. Swain uh, with the initials in um, red, as you can see. Um, really, really beautiful book. Um, the typeface um, there, we've got the, a blue initial, as you can see there, really, really lovely um, underneath the woodcut there. Um, the typeface is one of two uh, main typefaces which um, uh, Ashendine um, used. Uh, this is a Subi Subiaco um, type, 
um, and the, the the other type which uh, which Ashendine used was the Ptolemy. Um, it's widely felt by um, you know typographers and those interested in the book arts that the uh, Subiaco type, as we can see it here, is 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 much the more successful. Um, it's a really is really sort of pleasing type to look at actually, because although it is it is obviously um, you know a type and and, and uh, printed, um, it does give a really nice sort of suggestion. Of, of, a, of a calligraphic hand, uh, I think you'll agree. It's sort of got a nice sort of elegance combined with a sort of a chunkiness um, almost about it. Those aren't, um, aren't technical terms. Um, but yeah, really, really lovely type, um, which, was, which was used um, in a number of Ashendine Press books. Um, Ashendine Press um, founded, I should have said really, shouldn't I? Founded actually in, in 1895 um, and continued uh, with a break for the war for five years between 1915 and 1920, right up until 1935. So really, you know, produced many, many successful books. Um, they didn't tend to sell too many. Um, uh, many of the, the books were, was, were often given away as, as, as sort of, uh, um, or at least given to subscribers rather than sort of sold um, en masse, um, as it were. Um, and uh, yeah, the Ashendine Press founded by Charles Harold St. Well, I'd like to say St. John, but as he was upper class, I imagine it's St. John, St. John Hornby. Um, C.H. St. John Hornby, um, and he uh, he uh, gave uh, gave forth to the, the the wonderful utterance, I have worked for my own pleasure and amusement without having to keep too strict an eye upon the upon the cost. So yeah, that, that's kind of chimes with them. Um, what we said at the beginning really doesn't it about the um, prime um, prime sort of motivations of a of a, uh, a private press um here we have actually i mentioned earlier didn't i the fact that i was personally sort of unaware of whether this was a uh, I, I thought this was a kelmscott press book when i first saw it on the shelf and the reason um the first reason that i that i that i was aware that it wasn't a kelmscott press book um was that i sort of held it up to the light because i was on a mission at the time this is about seven or eight months ago when i sort of had the germ of doing this this talk tonight um and um i was on i was on the quest of the different kelmscott press watermarks um those of you who attended the, the talk last time and if you haven't by the way as I, as i think i mentioned you know do do please join us for for the for the talk focusing on William Morris um, on July the eighth, um, but yeah, I was on a hunt for the different Kelmscott Press watermarks. Kelm, uh, William Morris, as a, as many of you will know, um, incorporated three different watermarks into the Kelmscott Press books: um, a flower watermark, which is um, widely thought to be a primrose, um, a, uh, a perch fish watermark, um, and um, the other one, which I can't remember. At the moment, oh, oh, what is it? What is it? Perch, flower. Oh, I can't remember. But anyway, there are three watermarks with the Kelmscott Press book, and I was I held this book up, um, and I thought, well, that doesn't look like any of them. And of course, that was the bell which 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 set it ringing, which made me realise that this was a different book. Um, and it's the Ashendine watermark here, which is a hammer. I think you, you can see relatively clearly is a is a hammer and an anvil there. Right. OK, I'm conscious we've got half an hour. We're not doing too badly for time. Um, and there is the Ashendine Press um, colophon um, and press mark um, there. Interestingly, um, this particular Ashendine Press um, book was the last Ashendine book um, to emerge from the press in Italian. So this one, um, as any any Italian uh, speakers will have, will have seen, um, excuse me, in the in the Italian language, not not Latin or, or anything like that. Okay, let's move forward. So that's Ashendine, and we're going to move, move through and to consider a number of books by the Golden Cockerel Press then. So Golden Cockerel, um, talking about wood engraving, um, Golden Cockerel um, established in 1920 and became very, very successful. And really, um, I think it's one of the, one of the, possibly the press with, with possibly the exception of, of Kelmscott that has sort of impressed itself really um, on the mind of people who are sort of generally interested in in books you know they became pretty pretty well known they were founded in 1920 originally by Harold Taylor um, but Taylor sold the Golden Cockerel Press in 1924 to Robert Gibbings and really 
Um, it's the years in which Gibbings was the owner of the press from 1924 um, through to, um, I believe it's 30, 32, 33, 33. Um, this, this is the real sort of um, golden period of the Golden Cockrell Press, um, if you like, um, because it was this period that Gibbings, who himself was an extraordinarily accomplished um, and successful, you know, really successful um, in his own time, you know, um, financially successful as well as artistically successful um, wood engraver and artist. Um, he oversaw um, the production of some magnificent books, which really made um, full use of the talents of many of the main um, wood engravers um, in England um, and, and, and Britain at that time. Um, this particular book um, has a local collection, hence it being um, a local connection, hence it being in our collections. Uh, this is by um, R.H. Mottram, who's a local author. Um, it's got these beautiful um, patterned um, boards, as you can see in the, in the red and green, um, and uh, would have been much, much brighter and more vibrant, as I'm sure you uh, would, would recognize back when it was first published um, back in 1934, this particular volume. There's the, the spine title there, Strawberry Time by R.H. Mottram. So it's a work of fiction, Strawberry Time and the Banquet by R.H. Mottram. There's the title page with the golden cockerel. Uh, one of a number of golden cockerel um, press marks uh, which were designed. I can't remember which one this particular one um, is in terms of who designed it, but certainly Eric Gill, the artist and wood, wood engraver, um, very famous typographer and type designer as well. Um, I believe he he, he, uh, he designed one of the golden cockerel press marks. Um, and here, I, I, I mentioned wood engraving as being of central um, importance to the, to, the, to the work produced by the golden cockerel press. Um, and this book, it exemplifies that because it includes some marvelous um, wood engravings um, by the artist Gertrude Hermes. Hermes, um, absolutely wonderful, wonderful wood engraver. Um, she's famous also for, for being, um, you know, a renowned sculptor, um, but she also, as I say, did some marvellous wood engravings, um, as well as being um, an artist um, that produced in other media, so drawings and lino cuts um, and such like as well. Um, so this particular book, as I say, was published in 1934. Um, it was one of a series of books produced by the Golden Cockerel Press um, at that time. Um, of uh, first editions by famous contemporary modern authors. Um, Golden Cockle Press um, produced, you know, a number of different kinds of texts. They produced, as in this instance, um, works by modern authors, fiction, um, but also, you know, well-established classics um, and non-fiction uh, works as well, which we'll see an example of in a moment or two. Um, but I really think this particular book um, with the colophon there, actually, I'll just, I'll just go back. Um, just so we can have a, have, a, have a look at that wood engraving, um, really exemplifies Gertrude Hermes's really sort of sinuous um, style, you know, really sort of um, organic, making use of those sort of um, organic sort of shapes and these wonderful sort of textures um, in the use of the, of, the, of the wood engraving there. Um, so there we go, there's the colophon for that one with, this is obviously signed, as you can see by the author, uh, and gives the, the publication publish publication details um, there. Um, just one other golden cockerel book to mention then. So there are a couple of others in the in the heritage collections, um, but I just wanted to just just put this one in as an example of a non-fiction book to sort of um, you know just just show that uh, non-fiction um, formed part of the the golden cockerel's uh, remit as well. This particular book. Um, also interesting, um, as, um, as as you may know um, from from the last um, from the last talk I gave, I'm, I'm particularly interested in in wood engraving. I, I find it a really you know appealing um, artistic medium. So you know the, the the fact that the private press books at this time, in many instances, made um, you know really really featured the work of, of, of the key wood engravers of, engravers of the time is something that's you know very fortunate from my perspective but this as I say this particular book here is an example of, of non-fiction produced by the uh, Golden Cockerel Press this is produced obviously as you can see a bit later in 1953. Um, Golden Cockerel did go on for a number of years um, uh, I believe it was finally um, 
I think it went on into the 60s, actually. Uh, closed in 1961, apparently, in the Golden Cockrell Press. Um, but as I say, the, the, the real sort of important years are the, the 20s and the early 30s. Um, but this particular book uh, does feature a, a really fine um, frontispiece there, uh, wood engraved by the um, artist Geoffrey Wales. And I thought also it was worth just putting this one in because Geoffrey Wales is an interesting figure. Um, I'm not going to go into too, too much about him at the moment, but um, he, he might be someone I sort of feature a little bit more in, in future events because um, I believe, although he wasn't local to Norfolk, he settled in, in Norwich and taught at Norwich Art School, um, I believe in the 70s, I'm not entirely sure about that, um, but he's certainly a very, very well respected and influential wood engraver um, who in the, the 70s, 60s and 70s kind of kept the the tradition of, of wood engraving alive as it sort of fell um, sort of out of favour amongst the sort of um, those in the art world um, following the sort of um, high watermark of the sort of 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, but anyway, to get back to private press books. Um, so here we go, on to, on to the last one. We're sort of into the home straight now. Thank you for sticking with me. I'm, I'm, I'm sure um, I, I can see a, a handful of people have dropped off after the hour, which is absolutely fair enough. Um, I appreciate this is quite a long talk, but um, we've got 20 minutes to go and we're, we're on the home straight now um, with this, this sort of fairly um, unassuming looking um, book. This is uh, Comus, as you can see, Comus or Comus. Uh, again, another Milton work like the, the Dove's Press um, volume with which we sort of really kicked off the, the, the private press books. Um, and this one, um, again, um, I've included there a little bit of information there on sort of the, the, the half, well, sort of a half title page really, um, giving the context. The book, as you can see in terms of its text, was a mask um, by Milton, which was originally um, performed or presented at Ludlow Castle, as it says, in 1634. And we've got the title page of the volume, the sort of opening spread here with the frontispiece. Um, excuse me. And as well as being an example of the Greginog Press, which I shall talk about in a moment or two, um, I've got another example in a moment, which I'll, which I'll whiz through. Um, but I really particularly wanted to include this volume because of the wood engravings. Um, you can see um, with the example of the frontispiece here on the left hand side and then the, the, the illustration on the right hand side, um, the, 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 the wood engravings have, a, have a, almost a similar sort of style um, to Gertrude Hermes. They are by Blair Hughes Stanton, who is one of the, um, you know, real influential, again, and really influential figure in English wood engraving um, in the 20s and 30s. Um, Blair Hughes Stanton was in fact married um, to Gertrude Hermes um, at this period. Um, and that again, th there's a tale to, to tell um, in that regard. But if we move on, we can see these superb really really good illustrations they're not um perhaps um it's hard to get an idea of just how beautifully um intricate and textured these wood wood engravings are from from a computer screen from a screen um but i think you can get get a vague sort of idea in the flesh you know they're a lot more powerful and you can really really see um in much you know much better the the real fine work of these really really fine lines which blair hugh stanton was able um to to to, uh, to 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 produce uh, this particular engraving, as you can see, a couple of sort of uh, cavalier types, and then we've got a a lady uh, of the sort of of the period, sort of mid seventeenth century there. Um, but to get back to the press, this is uh, one of a number of examples of uh, of, of Greginog press books. So the Greginog um, press uh, was established in nineteen twenty two. Um, by a couple of sisters, Gwendolyn and Margaret Davis. Um, and basically they inherited, um, inherited a great deal of wealth um, and they had their own huge pile, um, Greg Enoch Hall in mid Wales, in rural mid Wales. And like many people um, in that position at that sort of time, they wanted to, to, to use their wealth, um, you know, for, 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 for beneficial public, um, good purposes, particularly with with regard to the arts. Um, I think it's right in saying I'm not. I think I remember reading this, but I believe um, the, the 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 Davis sisters were um, uh, sort of it sort of played on their conscience a little bit. Um, the sort of sources of their wealth. I believe it was sort of 
um, to do with mining in Wales, which you know was really obviously a hard occupation, and they felt a little bit sort of um, guilty about where their money came from. So they endeavoured to sort of um, uh, put their money into into a sort of artistic endeavour. So basically, they they, they envisaged Greginog Hall as being a kind of an arts and crafts and sort of artistic centre that would um, deal in uh, you know have have workshops and and produce um, you know arts and crafts and pottery and practical things as well as printing. In the event, um, it, it became known purely as a as a printing uh, a printing house. Um, but as I say, established in 1922, um, this particular book, as we can see by the colophon there, um, was, was completed on the hand press on the 11th day of June 1931. I love that about these colophons, you know, it's only a little thing, but the, the exactitude, you know, with which they put that into words, this was completed um, on this particular day. Um, you know, it's just one of those things that I think really adds to the, to the charm and the appeal um, of these books. Um, but Greginog, um, uh, sort of, I, I spoke earlier at the introduction about the sort of, you know, arguments about the definition of a private and a, and a, and a, a fine press and, you know, how, how private does a private press have to be and for it, for it to, to be accorded that status, you know, does it have to be one person, um, you know, and not make any use of any kind of external um, you know, sort of uh, printing or, or whatever, what have you. Um, but I think Greginog certainly can be considered, you know, pretty, pretty pure in terms of, in terms of being a press in as much as it was, um, everything was produced under, under one, one roof. So, you know, you had, um, you know, all the binding and the, the Greginog books are particularly uh, valued for, for the quality of their binding as well as, as well as the printing. Um, but, um, but yeah, so just to, very, very briefly, just to just to mention with with regard to Blair Hugh Stanton and Gertrude Hermes, um, Blair Hugh Stanton um, became one of the resident artists and sort of artistic director type figures at Greginog, um, who was brought in by the sisters and, and the Greginog board, um, and he went to live there with Gertrude, Gertrude Hermes, um, and this was great for the Greginog Press, of course, because as well as um, getting um, the, the artistic talents of um, Blair Hugh Stanton and his marvellous wood engravings that we've just seen. They also potentially had the had the talents to call upon of his wife Gertrude Hermes. Um, unfortunately, this was to end um, really quite badly. Um, Gertrude was commissioned by the press to to draw up um, to engrave rather um, illustrations for an edition of Gilbert White's um, Selborne, um, Natural History of Selborne. Some of which were completed and then. Um, printed, um, I believe, uh, sort of in the, in the late um, late twentieth century, but they were never actually fully completed and never made it into the into the final work because uh, Hugh Stanton and the Hermes's marriage uh, broke down at this time, um, and they went to live, live at Greginog. Apparently, they had two small children, um, and uh, Hermes was was under a lot of press uh, pressure. Um, with regard to the to the artistic commission, but Blair Hugh Stanton also we, we gather from um, doing a bit of research that uh, was um, not 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 a great husband in terms of uh, being faithful. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty pretty sort of traumatic um, story actually. But yeah, you can read more about that um, just by doing a bit of googling. Um, right, okay. So we're going to move on. As I said, we've got fifteen minutes. Okay, I think we're going to make it. I've packed in a lot into this one. Um, but I think we're going to make it. OK, so this is another um, example of a Greginog book, but contrasts somewhat to the to the to the John Milton Comus that you've just seen. Uh, the Comus incidentally was printed on Japanese vellum, which again, just like the wood engravings, you can't properly, of course, uh, get a sense of um, via via um, a computer screen. But Japanese vellum, it's not actual vellum. Actually, I'll just very, very quickly, very, very quickly. Um, go back. You can sort of see um, there. It's got this sort of um, off-white, sort of um, browny sort of tinge to it, and it's very tough, very tough paper. If you sort of if you handle it, um, as I say, it's called Japanese vellum, but it's not vellum. Um, it's not calf skin. Um, it's it's sort of long um, plant fibers, um, but it produces an almost sort of shiny, very very tough um, paper which is very, very good for um, 
taking the imprint of the of the wood engravings and the, and the type, as you can see. But um, it's sort of not really a luxurious material, really, because as I say, it's kind of shiny. Um, but it contrasts rather, as I say, with the next book, which is another Greg and Nog book. And you can see, um, you know, very, very different style, a much more opulent binding. Um, I believe it's pigskin, um, pigskin binding. Um, this one, yeah, white pig, pigskin with this sort of central um, sort of uh, decoration imprinted in gold leaf. Um, you can see another exterior view there with the spine. Um, and this one is pub was published in, in well, printed in 1935. And as I say, uh, another Greg and Og Press and it's Eros and Psyche, a poem in 12 measures. So it's by the poet Robert Bridges um, who had died um, five years earlier. So it's posthumous publication in that regard. Um, it's uh, quite a large quarto and it's got these wood engravings um, which were done after designs which were originally done by Sir Edward Byrne Jones um, for, a, for a project that he was working on with William Morris. I believe it was, um, I can't remember which particular book it was, um, but basically Byrne Jones designed these, these woodcuts intending them to be used in a, in a Morris book um, and then they were later resurrected uh, by Greg and Og Press and used in this in this volume here. Um, the interesting thing to note uh, about this particular book is it's the one Greg and Og book that made use of this particular um, typeface. Um, the typeface was based on one um, apparently that was used by Johann Neumeister for Dante's Divine Comedy um, of 1472, which was printed um, in 1472 at Folino. Um, so it's kind of a unique typeface for this particular book. And it's also got these wonderful, again, you'll, you'll notice similar um, uh, uh, woodcut initials, but after a sort of a calligraphic um, design um, by, um, is it Grady Hewitt? Uh, woodcuts, yes, Grady Hewitt. Um, so one of the students of, uh, of Edward Johnston, um, Grady Hewitt designed these one, wonderful um, initials which aren't hand drawn in they're printed but obviously after a sort of a calligraphic design and then we've got as I say these woodcuts originally designed by Byrne Jones but sort of done after Byrne Jones so they were cut I believe um, by um, by other employees of the Greg Nog Press. Uh, Lloyd Haberley I have written here. It was felt although the book itself is a marvellous thing and it's a really beautiful book um, if you read um, the, the, the book I referred to earlier, The Private Press by Roderick Cave, um, he describes in that how this, how this book was not particularly seen as successful on the terms which it set itself. It's, although the type um, was, uh, was, was felt to be uh, successful by, by a minority of, of commentators, many people felt it was uh, sort of too weak um, for the sorry, too heavy, too heavy for the to sort of complement adequately the uh, the wood engraved illustrations. But the, um, the the initials I think are really really lovely, as you can see. And then we've got the the colophon there giving details um, of the book's production. So we've got how many more books have we got to go? Three, three or four. So we're we're as I say on the home straight. Um, and this is an example, this next one, a very striking book, as you can see, brilliant, bright orange, although, as I say, again, much, much faded from how it would have appeared when it was um, originally, uh, originally published in 1928. Um, this is an example um, of a book produced by the famous uh, Nonesuch, um, Nonesuch Press. So Nonesuch Press, um, really the private presses, although um, you know, there are private presses and, and fine presses which continue to operate and, and particularly after the after a uh, sort of a, um, a, a sort of a, a, a resurrection, if you like, or a um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, a res resurgence. That's the word I'm looking for. A resurgence of fine presses and, and sort of an interest in typography and, and fine printing in the in the 70s and 80s. There are a number of private presses which and fine presses which operate in. In Britain and across the world uh, today, certainly in Britain, those would include Whittington Press and the Fleece Press, um, uh, the uh, Old Style 
press and the uh, various incarnations of the um, inky parrot and previous parrot presses. Um, but um, the sort of period that we're looking at, um, late 19th, early 20th century onwards, they kind of fall into two, two distinct camps. So you've kind of got Kelmscott and Doves and Ashendeen, um, and there are various other presses of the period which we haven't got examples of in the Heritage Centre, so I'm unfortunately not able to show you examples of those, but other presses such as the Aragni Press and the uh, Essex House and the Shakespeare Head Press. Um, but you've kind of got those, and then you've got sort of the presses which kind of emerged a little bit later, still pre-Second World War, um, but a bit later on, sort of after the First World War, really. So that obviously encompasses Golden Cockrell and Greganog, um, and also, as exemplified in this particular example, the Nonsuch Press. Um, so Nonsuch was, is, is really interesting and, and widely um, felt to be really sort of successful um, press um, and, and, and appealing to a modern sensibility in terms of its vision and its aims really, because it was founded um, in 1923 by Francis Maynell, um, who um, with his wife Vera um, and the writer David Garnett um, really wanted to form a press um, which, you know, didn't, um, you know, rely purely on antiquated um, purist notions of producing only a hand letterpress printed book, um, but which made the most of modern te technologies which were emerging. So the monotype um, printing, um, printing techniques um, and modern production methods and design um, uh, methods. Um, so the idea was to actually produce books um, Famously, Maynell said that he wanted to produce books which would be um, nice to collect, but for the collector who also wished to read his books and not shoot, not purely to put them behind a, you know, put them behind a, a glass bookcase. So here we have, as I say, a book published in 1920, and it's the um, the Dante uh, Dante's Divine Comedy, uh, produced by Nonsuch. Um, we can see it there. Um, it's quite a sizable volume. Unfortunately, you can't get a a, a great idea of the scale there but it's a really really beautiful book albeit notoriously prone to warping as you can see um Maynell was 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 keen that each of the non such uh, non such uh, productions should have their own visual identity so unlike doves and unlike kelmscott um he didn't want people to see one of his books and think oh yes that's that's a that's a non such book um, he very much believed in giving each book its own distinctive um, visual identity. So, so there isn't a kind of a house style. Um, to that end, with regard to the Dante, we've got this magnificent orange um, leather uh, exterior with the gold tooling uh, and the central motif and on the side and the borders. But as I say, as you can see, the, um, the material, although gorgeous to look at, um, the boards were prone, uh, prone to warping. Um, there's the there's the uh, the title page there as you can see, and then if we just sort of leaf through, you can see the text. You've got the the Italian uh, on the column on the left hand side um, with a, with an English translation in italics. Apparently, Maynell was um, was quite keen on putting his poetry um, into an italic um, type um, as he believed it slowed down the reader, slowed the eye of the reader, and enabled. Um, enabled uh, him or her to to uh, to take in the poetry more um, uh, slowly and and and, uh, and properly. Um, but as with you, you notice with this with this spread, once again the um, adherence to the to the Morris um, after the early printed uh, printers principles of those 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 wonderful um, margins um, and the and those proportions that we discussed earlier. Um, and this particular um, volume. Is, is famous for the illustrations which uh, from drawings by Botticelli. So um, we've got various depictions of uh, the various circles of of hell and various uh, uh, you know the various uh, scenes in Dante's Inferno here. Really, really, really lovely book. Pretty uh, grisly, but um, you know, really effective. Right, I'm gonna 
squeeze in. I've got a few minutes. Um, if any of you have to leave, by all means do so. I apologise. I'm going to slightly, slightly overrun, but I do wish to just skim through the next couple of books and then we'll we'll finish because this is um, a real, real jewel in the Heritage Centre's collection. Um, this is the um, Urn Burial and the Garden of Cirrus, of which we have many editions because it's by the Norfolk-based um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Writer, obviously, but um, uh, he, uh, Thomas Thomas uh, Brown, um, you know, was an inventor, scientist, philosopher. Sir Thomas Brown, very very well known figure um, in English literature, very influential, and we've got many examples of his work because, of, as, as I'm sure many of you will know, he, he based himself in Norwich. Um, and published many of his books, um, well, all of his books, um, based in Norwich. This particular work was originally published in 1658, um, but this particular edition obviously was printed much later in 1932, um, and it's particularly notable for featuring the high watermark of Paul Nash's, uh, the artist Paul Nash's um, achievements um, in the book art. He designed Paul Nash this book as well. Um, as I say, it was uh, printed in 1932. It was printed at the Kerwin Press, um, but published by Castle & Co. So this really is an example of a fine press book, really, rather than a private press, because there are a number of different um, printers and publishers um, involved um, in, its, in its production. The exterior of the book um, was uh, designed by Paul Nash. Um, you can see this wonderful large inlay of brown Morocco, this gilt Sort of lozenge design which takes from the um the, the text the the, the urn um, motif and then if we go through the rear of the book is is uh, the exterior cover is just as wonderful um it was bound um here we can see it in its slip case by san gorsby and uh, sutcliffe um very well known book binders and it's got this wonderful um gilt um gold edging and there's the the title page but what the book you know what, what the book is primarily known for um, is the wonderful illustrations, just some details there of the, the book's um, production. Primarily, as I say, known for the wonderful illustrations. So um, I'm just going to read out this very, very short. Um, this, this is from a book called Artists at Kerwin, um, which is uh, relates to the Kerwin Press by, um, by the author Pat Gilmore. I'm just quickly going to read this out. The book comprising twin texts by the 17th century writer Sir Thomas Brown was a superb choice for Nash's talents and demonstrated that half the secret of good illustration is to team the right artist with the right text. Urn Burial was a learned discourse on sep sepulchral urns found in Norfolk, while the Garden of Sirius explored the incidents of the lozenge pattern known as the quincunx, both as made by man and as found in nature. With their absorption in metaphysical speculation about life's mysteries as imaged in the world and on the geometry underlying nature, both texts might have been written with Nash in mind. And as you can see, as we leaf through um, that, um, that, that appraisal is, is, is completely borne out because it's got these marvelous um, illustrations by Nash, um, which are examples of, again, I'm gonna mangle the, the, the pronunciation um, of this, uh, the pokwa, pokwa, I'm not sure about that, um, the pokwa technique, but basically it's stenciling. So they were kind of hand stenciled um, at the printers um, after, um, after um, designs by Nash. Um, and as you can see, Nash really called upon every sort of bit of his sort of um, mystical, um, sort of uh, abstruse sort of imagination and artistic um, imagination to to uh, uh, summon up these marvelous images, which which uh, complement Thomas Brown's text. So we'll just leaf through those, and then I'm going to end it. I've, I've, I'm going to have to uh, cut it short, but uh, we're just going to go through the last of these illustrations, which I'm sure you'll agree are absolutely splendid. And I should say. Once again, just to iterate, if any of you find yourself in Norwich, um, you know, and want to pop into the library and come up to the Heritage Centre, as I say, at the moment, um, you have to, sorry, we'll go back, um, you have to book um, for a research slot, but in coming months, we very much hope that we'll be open 
for people just to walk in. Um, and as I say, everything you hold, you know, if it's reference materials such as the, the books that we've looked at tonight, um, nonetheless, you're able to look at them. You can ask the staff at the inquiry desk, fill in a request slip, and you're more than welcome to come in um, and examine these books at first hand for yourselves. So um, that brings it to a close. Um, thank you very much um, for attending this evening. It's been really, really, uh, really good to, to have you with us. Um, I appreciate you coming along. Um, and as I say, if you didn't attend that previous um, uh, talk uh, focusing on the William Morris books that we have in the collection, uh, we're repeating that on the 8th of July and that can be um, accessed via Eventbrite, but I'm sure Rachel will um, email that out to you um, in the coming days. Thank you very much. I will indeed. Thank you, Chris. Um, before we wrap up, uh, has anyone got any questions for Chris? Um, if anything occurs to you, you can always um, email us after the fact as well. Just have a quick look in the Absolutely. chat. Brilliant. OK, well, thanks very much, Chris. And thank you, everyone, for attending this evening. Thank you. Bye.